everyone. This is Vinu Deshetti. I'm with A Plusify. Hope you're having a great day. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. This is the first uh, part of our webinar series about your AMS roadmap. Today, we are um, our guest speaker is Mara Edwards. She's going to be talking about selecting your AMS, finding the right AMS. And we have Barbara Armantrout with us to be our moderator. Um, a few housekeeping things before we start today. Um, everyone will be muted during the course of this webinar. If you have any questions, um, you can either chat them, put them in the Zoom webinar chat, or you can also put that in the Q&A section of Zoom. Um, if you have any technical uh, questions as well, or if you need any help, I'm more than happy to help you out. Uh, simply just um, put a little message there in the chat section for me. We also have launched a poll. Please take a few seconds to uh, complete that poll. We'd love to hear from you. It will definitely help us with our conversation today. This webinar will be recorded. Um, all the recording will be sent to all of the attendees. Um, just give us about a day or two to clean up the recording and send that out to you. And with that, um, again, don't be shy. Use that webinar chat. We're happy to have that conversation there. I am now going to hand things over to Barbara and Mora. Thank you. Hi there, sorry, took me a moment to unmute. Hi, I'm Barbara Armantrout and thank you all for joining us. This is the first of our three-part series, the AMS Roadmap for Association Executives hosted by Aplusify. And all three sessions are going to be recorded and posted as the new has said. We're gonna begin with Moira Edwards session, setting you up for success, finding the right AMS for your association. Moira is president of Ellipsis Partners, LLC, a consulting team highly regarded for translating the needs of associations and nonprofits into clear strategic plans for technology development and implementation. She's also a founding leader of Association Women Technology Champions, who have a meetup later this week. For the middle segment, we'll welcome Niraj Garg, A Plusify's COO. He will toss out some peer to peer observations and thought provoking questions to amplify or explore elements of the AMS selection process. And then the third segment is going to be flavored by you, the participants. Please use the chat function throughout and we'll tackle as many as possible before wrapping up after 60 minutes. If something is essential to be inserted into the conversation immediately, we will do that, but otherwise, we will try to cover as many as we can in the third segment. So as an appetizer to this tasty meal, we've asked you to respond to the three poll questions. If you've not yet submitted your response, please voice your answers now. So we'll have a better sense of who's in the room and what your needs are as you're starting this fun process for selecting your AMS. Okay, Vanu, are we getting close to having a quorum in our poll or shall we keep going here? I think we should keep going. Okay, well then please join me in welcoming Moira Edwards and let's get the show underway. The adventure begins. Let's get going. Thank you, Barbara and Vinu. Thank you so much for the lovely introduction and for having me here today. And thank you everybody who's on the call. We appreciate you spending an hour with us today. So Vinu, let's go on to the next slide. I think it might just be another one of my face. <laughs> We're, we're bridging technologies here. There you go. Okay, right. so we're going to... <laughs> the beauty of Zoom. Yes, we will we're Zoom opening the other, um, our, uh, the other slide deck. So what we want to do today is we're going to talk about selecting an AMS as an example of selecting technology. So some of what we talk about today will be as useful to you in thinking about a new virtual meeting platform or planning for your new website. So um, I'm, uh, Barbara did a lovely job of introducing me and what I'd like to know is who do we have in the room? So last call for responses to the poll, we would appreciate, uh, because this will be relevant as we go through, as we think about what systems best suit you and your organization, knowing what size of an organization you are, how many staff is useful. 
knowing if you're under the gun and therefore how much time you have. It's a very different project than if you really either are not planning to make a selection right now or you have as long as it takes. If you're not rushing, I think you have a lot more um, leeway to be thoughtful about your process. And the third question then is what, what kind of system do you have? If you are an organization that has members and not everybody here is from a membership organization today, but if you have members and you have a membership database are you using Excel? We work with organizations that are coming from Excel mm. and Access. Maybe you have something homegrown, something that was developed uh, by in-house IT or by um, a company you partnered with. Maybe you have commercial systems uh, getting a little older and you're thinking about replacing it. Maybe you have something pretty new and um, you're still interested in, under in keeping your skills up to date or in looking around or if you have something else entirely, not only do we want you to select that on the poll, we want you to tell us in the chat what you have, because that sounds interesting. Venu, do we have enough uh, poll responses to show the results? I think we do. Let me uh -huh. look that out. And, and I, it has disappeared. Bear with me here. <laughs> I love that, I love that. Ah. You know, day is that day. <laughs> so there's a, there's a reason people don't do live television anymore, why so much <laughs> of what we see is recorded. Yay, and, yet, and yet we keep putting ourselves through this live webinars. So thank you, Venu, for the results. Many of the people with us here today are from smaller organizations. And I know that's particularly tough if you're trying to manage technology and you probably don't have too, many, too much IT skills in-house if you are less than 10 staff. Um, people, oh, I like to see that we, most people here have a reasonable amount of time. Um, mm -hmm. we will, we'll talk about timeline in a moment and about how really always kind of start with a year and go on from that. So if you're, if you're in the selection process and you want to be up and running in three to nine months, you have my sympathies and we'll talk, we can talk about that later. Um, and then for the people who are here. Um, a good spread of different types of systems in place um, with probably the most people having a slightly older commercial system that they're considering replacing. So that's great. Thank you. I appreciate this information that will help us um, uh, tailor to your, uh, to your needs as we go forward. So what are we going to talk about today? Thanks, Vanu. This is the, the right slide. We're going to have a good discussion about selecting technology, as I said. And We'll spend the first part talking about um, a framework for that. So um, when we think about a framework, it's all the things that you can set in place before you get going, all the things that you can think about before you get going. Um, and we're also going to talk, Vanu, where, where do my slides go? Thank you so much. <laughs> You're just you're you're just making this even more adventurous, right? I'm telling you, the Zoom ghost, the Zoom ghost has taken over. <laughs> so the framework will be one part, and then next slide, please. We're also going to talk a bit about the process and thinking about what will get you there. So next slide, because what does that mean? So when I'm thinking about the framework, I'm thinking who are the people you need to involve? How much time do you need to allow? How much is this going to cost? What systems should you be considering? How will you evaluate them when you, they are in front of you? And how will you manage red flags when they come up? So that'll be the bulk of, our, of, of this conversation today. We'll touch briefly on then the process. But once you've got your, your foundation in place, it's much easier to get going on things like requirements gathering, writing your RFP, your demonstrations and reference checks and negotiating your contracts and going into implementation. So we'll spend less time on that. Next slide, if you would please, Vanu. So let's dive in and think about who should be on your teams. And I would typically differentiate between having a core team and having a selection team. So your core team might be one person. It, sometimes we'll see up to maybe four, right? But these are the people most deeply involved and invested in this project, the people really driving this. And then your selection team 
will be drawn from around the organization. So this is the group that commits to doing a lot of the heavy lifting, reading proposals, attending every demo. They're very committed also, um, but they may not be everyone in the organization. You should, however, go further. Ideally, everyone in the organization will be involved at certain stages. When you are gathering requirements, if you can bring together the full events team, the full membership team, and really understand their needs, then that's going to be part of getting buy-in for your system later on. But moving back then to your selection team, bring in those that are influencers in their area so that when you do launch your new system, they'll be local champions of the new system helping with adoption. And then I think you bring your mavericks onto your mm -hmm. selection team. I, you know, as, as Michael Corleone said, keep your friends close and your enemies closer. Um, Gretchen Steenstra has another nice way of putting it. You want somebody inside the tent peeing out, not outside the tent peeing in. Um, I just think, yeah, Mavericks have something to say and better that they say it inside your group so that you can address it than to be disrupting your efforts talking outside of the group. So I think it's important to just embrace them and, 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 and find the truth that they actually have are trying to contribute to the conversation. Have you ever seen Mavericks converted to become influencers through the process? Absolutely, because, you know, they're not, Mavericks are not true a-holes, right? They're, they're actually people who are very passionate and they're only Mavericks because they haven't been listened to. So if you can take the time to listen to them and pull out that which is important and help them frame that within the project or the organizational goals so that they have a direction and that energy is, is, is given a place to go, absolutely. They can be some So these are best. mavericks with need, not simply mavericks who are resisting change because it's change. It's even, That's even yeah. yeah, but there's so many different types. I mean, some people are curmudgeons, right? Just for the sake of it. They, they like to be contrarians. And even, but even they, again, are doing it out of a fairly noble cause. They don't want us to fall into groupthink. The only people I find that are really difficult to work with are those that truly exhibit narcissistic uh, characteristics because mm. it's really hard to bring those people around to a common viewpoint because they will consistently return to the viewpoint of what's best for me, not what's best for my organization or my team. After people though, the next thing to think about is a timeline. Next slide, if you would, Vinu. So, you know, we saw in the poll that most people have some time available. Some are, are working to really get moving in the, the, the three to nine month timeline. That's really tough. You know, it's possible to do an AMS in less than a year, but it's rushed. So like, think about how this is going to unfold, right? You, you take about a month to go talk to everyone, gather requirements, write up a good RFP, have people review it, right? Then it's ready. You, you issue it and then you get proposals back and you read those. Maybe by the third month now, you're doing demonstrations and you're doing first demonstrations, then deeper ones. So by the fourth month, you're doing really deep dives. You're doing reference checks. You're uh, doing contract, you know, maybe starting to look at contracts. Maybe you're going to the board to get approval. You're four months in really before you're pretty sure you've found the system you need. And then contracting takes a month. I don't know why. It always takes at least a month. One would think that these are standard contracts, but it does. For the simplest system, it, by the time everybody has a chance to read it and they're dense documents and your legal people and the legal information is sent back to your vendor and it comes back, it takes a month. You always have to allow that gap in time between selecting an AMS and really having everything signed. And it can take much longer. But if you're on your fast path, then you're into implementation. And maybe for a small organization, you could think about six months, but that is tight. Nine to 12 months is really better for implementation. And if you are an, an organization of any size, the more time you give yourself, the better. I th you know, I learned, it's about 20 years ago now, take time to do it right. From having awful technology 
launch failures. Like really, um, one, in one association, we ended up on the front page of the New York Times, our new technology was so awful. Um, in another, I was dreadfully sick, but I was still at their conference um, speaking to the crowd because we had launched technology. De different wouldn't do that today. <laughs> I know, wouldn't do that today. <laughs> so um, really, if, if there's one, th one, there are two things to take away from this slide. A, set expectations of at least a year. Just, just start talking that up around the organization. And B, um, learn from those of us who have failed badly that the one thing you want to do is take time to do it right. And then maybe you can escape some of the bruises we've had along the way. So, Fanu, on the next slide, we just, what are your timeline constraints? Like, what's on your calendar that you can't move? It's your conference, it's a board meeting, virtual conference. What, what are times when your staff are off? If you close over Christmas, and I, you know, that's a great thing that nonprofits do, yay. Mm -hmm. um, there's really not much point in, in scheduling too much for the holiday period. So, reading contracts. Right, you can sit beside your Yule log and um, you know, read your contract, but it's still, you're not going to get a lot of responses from your vendor about changes to the contract in that time, which I think is reasonable. Mm -hmm. So now on the next slide, I'm gonna give you some figures, some honest to God figures from our experience. And I'm going to use the size of the organization as a, as a proxy metric for complexity, for the complexity of the work that you do. Now, it's not entirely accurate, but in general, you can say, right, that a five staff association has less complex operations than a hundred staff association. So on that basis, I think if you're a smaller organization and I'm, I'm thinking less than 10 staff, then you can expect implementation to be in a very wide range of five to 150,000. And why so wide? Because if you have one staff person, you're going to go and find an AMS that you can just sign up online, subscription, start using. Um, you know, that's at the very low end. There's going to be no implementation, very little data migration. You're just going to sign up and use it. But the more, and with 10 staff, you can be doing some pretty complex things the higher you up you get in complex operations, different programs, very complex events, then the more you're going to have to configure a system, probably migrate data in from your prior system. And that's when you get to that higher end of up towards 150,000. If you're medium sized, and I, in my own, this is kind of my own scale of, of, of staff size, and I, I'm saying 10 to 30 staff, we see implementation ranging around 100 to 300,000, depending again on all the different things you needed to do to make your operation work well. And then if, so, and what this includes, what, what this figure, this mad, these huge numbers, what do they include? Well, they're gonna include discovery by your vendor partner. They're gonna include configuration of the system, maybe some customization testing of that then there'll be data migration there will be then getting ready everything ready from to move into launch moving from uh, production to, sorry from um, development to staging to production doing training for your staff and um, doing project management tasks and then once you launch going going live after launch so all of that is typically included in that amount of money and then if you're a large organization of 40 staff or more, you know, I would expect implementation to start at $200,000, you know, it's, um, it's a lot of money. Barbara, are there any questions coming in about those figures? Well, people... there's a question on whether it's total costs or is this acquisition costs? So I, I think you were just mentioning this is the, the, this is some of the total costs, but it's not just signing it's on not... the contract. You're right. Um, if we actually go to the next slide, so then there's ongoing costs and, and quite often. Um, uh, and we do have a question on why the spread is so large for smaller organizations. It, because a one staff organization is so different to a 10 staff. 
right? Um, like if I am a one staff and I kind of have my own little organization, I'm going to use something that's totally pre-built. I am not going to conf hardly configure it. I'm definitely not customizing it. I'm really just going to accept it. I'm going to be totally like survey monkey. I'm just going to go and use it, put in my survey, put in my data and use it. If I am 10 staff, 10 staff can do an awful lot of work, right? So I think you're right that probably in some ways the biggest spread is at that lower end of the market. And that's why there's so many options there. Um, if you go and look at review my AMS, you know, there's so many that are at the lower end. So yes, ongoing costs. If we go uh, just to the next slide, I'm just going to oh, talk about, yeah. Okay. So you know, they ask was um, about whether that's all the costs. Well, you have to plan for what you're going to spend every year. Many of our vendor partners will charge the license costs in the first year. Um, that's kind of their stand, a standard process. Um, even though you may not be using all of them in the first year, this is one way that they um, cover a pretty big effort that they put in place in year one. So I typically, total rule of thumb budget, $200 per person per month in licensing fees. It's, it's, um, it's true enough. It's not, I mean, like definitely there are other, uh, some are, are cheaper, some are more expensive, but it's true enough that it'll give you some sense of what you can expect. Um, and then for me then, the, the big thing is to have money in my back pocket. So I'm gonna have contingency budget. Um, that could be 10%, it could be 30%, depending on how, uh, you know, the scope of your project. The smaller the project, the, the bigger, higher the percentage. The bigger the project in some ways, the lesser the percentage. But have some contingency money in your, available to you for when things go wrong and get delayed, because they will. We know that, I mean, let's not pretend it won't. For training, you will have some training included in your initial process, but you know, plan for more training than you think you'll ever need because that's a key part to having a system adopted. Especially plan if for you have staff turnover, which always happens during these long time periods. Right, you'll have onboarding training for new staff coming in, but you also need refresher training because people will do it once and then they'll forget it when they get to need to use it more, mm -hmm. you'll want advanced training. So there's a lot that, um, there's a lot of training you're gonna need. Excuse me, so, um, and then plan for future phases. When, you're, when you go live, you'll have gotten in everything that's absolutely critical, but there'll be a lot of stuff you'll have delayed simply because you won't be able to get it in in time. So know that you're gonna have phases, excuse me, phases two and three. And I think I'm going to toss in this question from Lillian. I hope I'm saying your name right. How do you balance training with keeping SOPs? Well, I think your SOPs become your training documents. And so as you update your SOPs, that's what you then train from. Um, you know, and a nice SOP will have screenshots in it. And then your training is a framework that says, okay, let's go through the SOP for adding a, a, a new contact to the, the, the database. And there's the SOP. And then you talk, now let's practice that. Let's do an exercise. You have quizzes, you build your training around the SOP, but that's the core document you need to keep up to date. And then just plan for additional development. As soon as you've gotten launched and phase two and phase three done, your organization has certainly changed. You have new initiatives, new programs, and the board and your leadership and other departments will be coming to you saying, can we do this? Can we configure that? Can we have this online? So there's always more money in technology than we ever think. I remember, um, one of our vice presidents, when I was at Stafford and Association, one of our vice presidents coming and standing in the door and said, so when will the system be finished? <laughs> and I said, never. And he was truly shocked. He was really shocked. But we made it better every year. We were developing custom software for our members and every year they had different needs. So it is uh, really in some ways a never ending story for technology. So it does- The finance vice president? No, legal actually. Oh. Yeah. Hmm. 
So in the, on the next slide, then we'll talk about different options. And so for those of us coming new to this, we know there are new options out there based on Salesforce, based on Microsoft Dynamics CRM. And we think we have to make a choice based on the technology. But that's actually not true. The thing you have to make a choice on is based on the complexity of your organization and therefore the complexity of the system you need. So we were talking about the widespread. And this time I, I was kind of breaking um, organizations down into maybe the very small, the smalls, and medium and up through larger. You know, those at the very, very small end really and truly are going to buy something totally off the shelf. Um, they're just gonna sign up and use it. Some small organizations, maybe around less than 10 or around 10 staff, have used Salesforce or Microsoft CRM for very specific needs. But for most organizations of that size, a platform base is gonna be a little bit of overkill. They're probably better off going for something that's much more productized. It's just built out, it does what it does, and it does it well. But the more you get up in size, your medium, medium to large, larger, the more complex things are, you're going to need either a big platform-based solution that allows you to plug different things in, or sometimes a very mature proprietary system that can handle, that already has all of the functionality for an association built in. So either way, these things have to be very connectable because they're going to be at the center of a suite of tools, particularly the larger you get, the more complex you are, the more programs you are. It's a bit like buying a vehicle. Do you need a scooter, right? I, all I need is a scooter to get down the road to shop and back. Maybe I need a Honda Civic. I've got a little bit more of a journey, more people. Maybe my family's growing and I need a minivan, right? I, or I've got the soccer team. Or do I actually need a full bus? The whole thing that you know and with the diesel engine and but when you think about that think not just about the capacity think about the cost the cost to purchase right this 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 vehicle the cost to then maintain it like to put gas in it to use it the, the larger more complex the system the more you will spend not just up front but in day-to-day maintenance and you and and so th the more that you can really be aware of where you fit in the market and find systems that really meet your needs but aren't too big for you i think that's going to be your best decision so let's talk a bit on the next slide about making a decision right so we look at several criteria in evaluating systems for organizations and so on the next slide one of the first areas of course will be functionality. And this is not just the details of your business processes, though that's important, but it's also where is your organization going? What do members join for? If your organization is known for events, then your event registration should be amazing in your technology. So think about what differentiates you in the market and make sure your technology clearly supports that. Next slide, Vanu, please. So then we think about cost. We talked about implementation cost, right? Those first year big chunks of money. We talked about ongoing costs for licensing and for um, updating. But you also have to think about staffing. Um, the more complex the system, the more you're going to need either somebody in-house or somebody, uh, so an implementation partner who's going to keep working with you to... Um, uh, to, to, you're going to need that level of staff within the organization. So if you're a large organization, you already have an IT team. But if you're a small organization and you don't have somebody in IT, you should really think about that as you look with joy at the larger platforms that look really lovely. On the next slide, uh, thank you. I thought you were one ahead of me. So fit, your fit with an organization. As this is where your spidey sense comes in. <laughs> But we break it into three areas. So capacity. Do we have the staff and the skills in-house or available to us to run this system? Is this a good fit tech in our, for our capacity? 
is it a good fit from the technology? Is the roadmap for the system, does it have a future that's aligned with our future and where we want to go? And then, you know, is the culture of this vendor aligned with our culture? Now that is a very hard one to de define, but you know it when you see it. So we've had several clients who called us in after failed implementations. And they, they, they called us in then because they wanted to make a better selection the next time around. And one of the threads that emerged in the failures was that the, the, their vendor partners, their AMS companies, they saw themselves as these progressive, modern, exciting technology companies. And they got the organization all excited too. But these were small clients with really maybe one IT person or no IT people. So there was no CIO, there was no tech team to oversee the project. And it was really too much for the organization to handle. So each of those ones did better with a smaller company that saw themselves as a service company as well as a technology company. So I, that's what I mean by looking for one that's a good fit culturally. And then when we think about risk, you know, this is the other spidey sense. Um, you know, you've, you've just about fallen in love with a system. Maybe there's two systems, hopefully, that are strong finalists and you're trying to decide between them. This is where you should dig as deep as you possibly can into all of the dirt that you possibly can, right? So you're going to go talk to references and it is amazing what references, ref, people who do provide references will tell you. It's not all glowing. They are so worth doing. You're going to go and look for reviews online. You're going to go to um, you know, ASAE and ask people in the um, Collaborate or in other online communities what they think. You're going to go to, oh, if you can, go to the user group conferences and see what kinds of questions people have at those conferences. Find an unhappy client. If you can find them, this is maybe the one time when a consultant is useful because we know unhappy clients, right? And I have to tell you, one time I had a client about to choose a system and I heard of somebody who was very unhappy with that system. And I called her up, and we had a good chat and she talked to her exactly why she was unhappy. And it turned out they had really over-customized at the beginning, and she knew that. And they were having a hard time kind of resetting to the vanilla version as the new functionality had come on. Well, to me, that was not a deal breaker. It was a lesson learned, don't over-customize. And in fact, she called me back about a month later to say that the company had reached out to her and were working to fix it. In fact, she would recommend them. So she was an unhappy client, but it wasn't that the it wasn't a deal breaker of a review. We had another client about to choose a product and we heard about a bad experience that another organization had and we called them and we heard about some egregious behavior. I mean, name calling. And um, we advised our client against going with them. They chose something else. So the more that you can find out what it is really like to work with an organization the better you'll be able to plan which ones to, to go with. So my next slide kind of plays on that some more. You know, Maya Angelou said, when someone shows you who they are, believe them the first time. So I think this is true in the hiring um, process for staff. I think it's true in the dating process. And I think it's true in the technology selection process. We have a client right now and their kickoff meeting two weeks ago was very strange. This is not an AMS, but this kickoff meeting was rushed. It was incomplete. And the project manager refused to come on camera because he had not had his hair done, even though the meeting had been set up for a week. So our client was like, we don't, we don't think this is the best start to a project. So the company went and they changed the PM. So there's a new kickoff, still a bit strange. And then the discovery process started to be a bit weird like um, people who were, who were billed as experts were not very expert. The new PM was reading a book on camera <laughs> during meetings. He said they're reading a book. So they changed the implementation team. When you, see, when you have warning signs, pay attention to them. On the next slide, I'm, I'm only going to just really touch on the process because I really wanted to help you think about the framework for, for success. In the process, I just, we see it in three phases. In the first phase, be thoughtful. This is a time before you hear any sales talk 
to think about what you need. What is it that we do? What do we do well? What do we need to do well in the future? And gather your requirements, develop your RFP, think about good systems that might be a fit. In your second phase where you're out there looking at systems, be skeptical, right? Ask all the questions, poke all the holes, put your fingers as much as possible into the systems so that you, um, you get as close to, you take as, away as much of the dazzle of the sales process as, as possible and get down into the details. And then in the, in the third phase, when you're actually, you've selected a, a, a new system, be thorough, take time, focus on the details and take your time so that you really have a thorough process of, of, of implementation. But however, I will say this on the next slide, implementation is a bear. It's awful. It, it's just going to take up all your time. I'm so glad to know that as part of this series, a Plusify is following up on the selection process. I think um, next week there is going to be an implementation session with Gretchen Steensra from Delcor. She's great. Then um, following that, there's going to be a session on post-launch life with Rebecca A. Church, another great speaker. So I think you're, those are going to be important to round out the whole picture. So let's move on to questions. I want, I want to make sure we have time for questions. Um, Barbara and Niraj, do we have any questions coming in? We, we actually do have one that Michael posed, um, which is how do you decide between a single AMS that tries to do everything versus a collection of integrated best of breed tools? So a, the, the biggest thing is what makes you competitive in the, market, in the marketplace to your members? Why do your members come to you? If they come to you for certification, then you should have a best of breed certification module. But maybe you might have awards as part of your AMS because the awards are not as important. If, however, you are the industry leader in determining professional excellence and the awards that you give are renowned people you know like it, it, it's in the papers when people get that award you better make sure that your award system is best of breed and maybe you're at that stage you know your certification is just handing out a few certificates after webinars it's maybe that's not as important so to my mind the things that are your competitive advantage in the marketplace are the things that you have best of breed tools for, and the things that are not as important, maybe you fit those into a comprehensive AMS, because unless you have really good IT support, you don't mm -hmm. always find it easy to manage 10 different systems with integrations between all of them. Well, and often those that are supporting the best in breed are revenue sources, so they would be worthy of getting the best in breed. Absolutely, good point, yeah. Niraj, how about you? Yeah, thank you, Barbara. And first of all, thank you, Moira, for uh, this informative session. Uh, it's a privilege to have you here. And thank I would you. like, and I would like to take this opportunity to ask uh, some questions which actually crop into my mind. And I think one of the first questions which I think uh, most of the audience would also be interested in asking is, uh, what makes people leave their prior AMS? Um. So that's a really good question, Niraj. Thank you. Um, you know, I think it's not just features and functionality and bits and bytes and, you know, storage capacity. Um, I think people leave their AMS when they have a sense that they can no longer get their problems solved with this technology. So, and that has different elements. You know, it could be a sense of not being a priority with the client, with the, the, the partner. It could be maybe the systems not being developed. But, you know, if I were to, if actually, if I were to give you one word as to why people leave their AMS, it's trust or lack of trust. They no longer trust that they can succeed with that technology or that partner. Oh, yeah. I think that, that makes sense. I think yeah. trust is something which actually drives any relationship that you have, whether it's a vendor, a client relationship, or any other relationship, right? So. Right, right. And if, if there were, you know, if there were any AMS companies listening here today, if, 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 if they could bottle trust, if they could kind of think about how their 
their sales process, their discovery, design, implementation, support, you know, uh, training. If all of those processes fostered trust, they would not have as much turnover. When you don't have trust is when you lose clients. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, so my next question would be, uh, working with different clients, we hear from them that they wish they had known how much daily maintenance is needed before selecting an AMS. So what, what would you recommend before selecting an AMS in order to avoid this bias uh, remorse? Right? What, what is that uh, um, thing? Yeah. Take care of. It, well, I, a system that needs a lot of maintenance is typically a fairly big system because you, maintaining your data, everybody needs to do. Uh, hopefully you've got some really nitpicky person in your organization who's watching member data and registration data and cleaning it up as they're going along. So that's different. Everybody has to do data maintenance. But system maintenance and care and feeding, you know, I think that comes back to that sense of, did you buy a system that meets the complexity of your organization? Did you, and if possible, could you, did you avoid customization, go with configuration? Um, but did you, did you avoid the shiny object? Mm. That's right. So the, but I think that the key to it is being very clear on the requirements and the goals that you have. And this is why I like to have that first phase being thoughtful and really focused on what you need before you get entranced by what's on offer. So be, go, back, go back and read your RFP actually before you make your final decision. We do that actually when proposals come in, we go back and read the RFP. What is it again we were looking for? Reread the RFP before you make your decision. Reread the RFP even during implementation because that was when you were most clear about what you were trying to achieve, what was important to you. And when you're in the middle of meetings and people want this tiny niggly thing to be done, um, you can lose sight of the bigger picture. So um, I think that's the, the key thing you can do is be very clear on what is important to you. Yeah, that makes sense. And uh, you were talking about data maintenance, right? So is that something that uh, you uh, tell the users to take care of? Because most of the times we have seen that uh, when selecting a vendor or they don't have a dedicated staff who is actually looking after their data Excel. Uh, apart from the other maintenance activities? You know, it's hard. I mean, we work a lot with smaller organizations and people are wearing an awful lot of hats. I mean, a larger mm. organization hopefully will have somebody dedicated to data maintenance. They'll be thinking about data governance. They'll be thinking about uh, privacy and kind of, you know, GDPR. I mean, so there's so much in there. Um, but a smaller organization is really thinking about operations and you know getting things done. So we do try and and and, and ha have organizations think about how they will certainly clean up their data in migrating it to a new system. And we also think about the procedures or the policies that will keep the data clean as they go along. But it it, it is it is it's a a problem actually for every organization, even those with plenty of resources. And, and I'm gonna interrupt because Lillian and Sharon are having a wonderful conversation in the chat box that I wanna blend into this. And Lillian was asking, when do you recommend hiring a consultant for evaluating a new AMS system? And Sharon has observed that she got good advice to talk with an implementation person, not just a salesperson. Right because of the, the different perspectives they will bring to that. And I think that fits into some of what you were just saying. It does. And so, I, you know, obviously full disclosure, I'm an AMS consultant, um, but I would say you don't need one. You don't like, you could make a good selection if you spend time, you know, thinking and doing things like this, coming to a webinar and educating yourself about a process and educating yourself about the, what's available in the market. Um, I think, I think what a consultant brings is um, expertise in what other associations are doing. So bringing in that kind of sense of, of how have others faced that challenge, knowledge of what's available in the market. 
So what are the systems out there and what would be a good fit? And also a, a movement, a sense of movement. If you are a smaller staff or even a large staff, but you, nobody has a time to get this project going, then I think a consultant really helps you move it along and they, it goes smoothly because they do have expert experience and expertise to do that. Um, and I, then, then, then the other point being, they, they, we, we, we often, we spend a lot of our time gathering news from the grapevine. So we're always listening out for what company might be going through an acquisition, what company is going through layoffs, what company is doing upgrades, what company is maybe getting sold. So um, that kind of behind the scenes information is useful, though you can get a lot of it from like a review site. So again, I don't think you absolutely have to have um, a consultant. And I say that with the hoping that you would, you know, with the best, with the, you know, with full, full, full ethics. <laughs> well, and, and a funny little story that I lived was a few years ago when I went from a large consulting group in the membership side on staff and I shared information during one of my early staff meetings. And I was basically told to stay in my lane because it was off topic of what I had been hired to do. True. It was, but I was thinking, well, Three weeks ago, you'd have paid me good coin be because people listen to consultants. consultants. Yes. You know, often a consultant voice is, is yes. heard more as an objective viewpoint than a staff person, even when we say the same thing. You're entirely right. So if you are a staffer who's fighting a battle and you're not getting heard, sometimes making an argument for a consultant can help you bring some of that external perspective of, I mean, maybe some rational thinking into it, hopefully. I, I would agree with that. Um, and I loved what Sharon said about talking with an implementation manager. You're right. If you, there are a lot of really good uh, implementation companies out there, um, A plus I is one in all fairness, um, who are deep into different technologies, right? And so they can actually give you some good insight into the, the, the positives and negatives of different systems. It's a good thing to do maybe when you're down to some finalists and different companies specialize in different things. So, I mean, as a consultant, you know, I, I you know, I actually try and be educated in all of the systems and I, I, I won't in fact be coding or deep inside a system because I don't want to get too fond of any one system. My goal is to be unbiased and to treat all of these options fairly and just fit them to the client, pick the ones that's the best fit, not the one that I just personally like. So, so we don't do, um, and a lot of the consultants don't do coding, but the implementation partners who do do coding and who get to know particular systems well are great people to ask for that kind of advice um, when you're close maybe to make a decision. And, and they can also determine that when I've heard people quote, well, this is a best practice, so we have to do it. But a best practice does not fit all sizes and all needs or all complexities. It's best so for yes, who? it might be a best practice, but no, it's not something that your association should do. Right. And that is where a consultant can be a little more agnostic. I'm sorry, Niraj, I'm, I'm interrupting into your questions. <laughs> no, that's fine. <laughs> So, Myra, based on your vast experience that you have uh, in the AMS systems, um, if I ask you, like, what is the biggest red flag uh, that is there during the selection of AMS? Mm. What yeah, what's the biggest red flag? You know, I think it's when people go for the shiny object. Um, we had... I'm thinking like we had a very small organization that had fallen in love with the reporting capabilities of a very large system. And it, I mean, they were gorgeous. I mean, like those reports were absolutely amazing, but we had to remind them that um, reporting, while it's lovely, was not actually the most critical thing they were trying to achieve. The most critical things that they were trying to achieve was, it was a certification process, was moving people effectively through a certification process. And so that kind of brought them back to their senses. So I think, what, you know, to me, it's a red flag when people are talking about things as wonderful that are not critical to the operation, that are not the goals. Um, 
so and what ties into that it, another red flag is really when the sales process is too positive when sales people say yes to everything we talked about maybe having a conversation with an implementation person, you know, ask the salespeople probing questions. Is this feature available now or is it on your roadmap? Mm -hmm. Because it may not be available now. Is it, uh, mm -hmm. the biggest one is, is it available out of the box or with configuration? Ah. That is huge, particularly now um, we do have more platform-based solutions. I mean, Salesforce and Microsoft Dynamics CRM can do just about anything. I mean, really and truly, they can do just about anything that you want them to do, but there is a cost to getting there and there can sometimes be a painful road in getting there and some time. And if you don't have, uh, maybe you have the money, but you don't have the time or the skills, then that's good to know. You, this is, um, you, you want, you would, you want to hear during your sales process, no, our system does not do that unless you spend X amount of money or time. And then you're, you know, you're getting behind the sales talk, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Anything else, Niraj? What else? Yeah, few more, sorry, Moira. No, uh, you're fine. <laughs> So, uh, so like we have selected your vendor who is going to implement your AMS. Uh, you know, you are about to sign the contract, uh, with, right? Now, what, what are the key things that you should keep in mind when it comes to implementation of that AMS? Because that is the key when everything is going to get implemented. Because you have to vendor. So you talked about a contract. And I think what's interesting about that is we often think about the contract as a legal document and not a technology document, but you are signing up for technology products and services. So, mm -hmm. you know, what we do is we would look for things in there about the project management process. Sometimes it'll say, we're going to give you specifications and we want you to turn them around in seven days. And that is not enough time to read specifications and comment on them. So we're typically going to extend that to 14 days, 21 days, whatever our client, be really knowing the workload their staff have, we want to expand those, those that turnaround times. We want, to, we want to talk about the team composition. Who's the project manager? Do you have veto power? I mean, it's hard to get that one where you can say, I want veto power, my project manager, but I would ask for it because that's the thing that's the thing that has the most impact on the success of most implementations, who the project manager is at your, on the AMS vendor side or the web vendor side or the virtual meeting side. Is it somebody who knows the technology, knows how it works, knows how to implement it, knows what clients are going to do with it when it's live? An experienced project manager is worth their weight in gold. Um, but other things that you should look out for. Uh, we had one client who when uh, the system went live, not everything was in there, it wasn't complete. And, but all the money was spent. And there was nothing in the contract that tied the, the money to the deliverables. So what we've seen now in contracts is there's a process for clarifying all the requirements and then that is included by reference in the contract. When you sign off on the requirements after discovery, that becomes part of the contract. Um, Similarly, we, we see payments in a contract tied to months or timelines, not to deliverables. Really, your payments, I mean, most companies need a big chunk up front so they can get their implementation team going. That's okay. But at that stage, then, there should be some incentive for them to complete everything. Like, there should be some reasonable chunk of money that doesn't get paid until everything is finished to the client's satisfaction. Um, uh, exit, ter, you know, termination clauses. We had one client trying to get out of an, a learning management system and they went back to the company and said, we're going to use a different system. <clears throat> and the company said, oh, well, let's see, let's check the termination clause. Mm -hmm. And our, our client went and looked and went, said, oh, there isn't one. And the company said, exactly. And they were on the hook for two more <laughs> years subscription. Yeah. So... You, you want a termination clause. You want to know what happens when you do terminate. You want to be able to get your data out. Even if you have to pay for it, you want to have the right for a data extract. Ideally, you don't want auto renew, right? Uh, like uh, if you auto renew, I know it's very easy to do auto renewal and it's often part of it. But if you, if you, if you can, do not have auto renewal. And if you must have it, 
put a 90 day notification to yourself on your calendar because you've probably mm -hmm. got to notify 60 days in advance and you need some time to think about it. So, you know, some of those really practical things need to be in a contract. And this is why you told us to allow at least a month for the contract. Aha, uh -huh. because you want to try and get this stuff in, right? Mm -hmm. uh, one more important question, Mara, and that is something that face, uh, I think, uh, most of the times with our clients is we work with a lot of uh, people from C-level executives to Salesforce admin users to users, right? And sometimes all of these users uh, like feel that they are disengaged from the system and they like, it's like AMS is forced upon them, right? It's like they don't want to use it. AMS is something which was not their cup of tea and it has been forced upon them. And that is where the real problem lies, right? So how, how do you tackle that problem? And we face that every day and we have faced that with most of our clients. And we really, we really yeah. don't know how to get out of it. Well, I can understand that. Um, because sometimes it's, it, technology can be scary, overwhelming, and so people back away a little bit. Unless there's a really dedicated campaign to bring them back in, they can become disconnected from the project and ultimately from the system. So that's why I would say, first of all, in your selection process, bring everyone in. Have everyone's voice, especially your mavericks, but it's, you know, every, have requirements gathering with leadership at the very beginning. Have, make sure you know what they want to achieve from the technology. So bring everyone in and hear all of the voices and make sure your initial goals reflect not just the details, but the strategic goals. And then while you're going through implementation and launch, it's a terribly tough time. Ha have a communications campaign. You know you're gonna have one for your members, right? that we're gonna launch this new system, you're gonna to have to reset your password, you're gonna be thinking in some way about member communication if you change your AMS. Think about your staff communication. Inform them, what I tend to do is inform people all along the way. And I give them opportunities to provide feedback all along the way, but I keep moving. So if they don't provide feedback, it doesn't slow us down, but if they do, then I can take it and absorb it and incorporate it and then keep on moving. So I think, having a communications campaign with staff so that they feel informed and have buy-in and, and are heard is important. And then at, once you're up and live training, training is a way to keep people connected to the system. And it's and not Training just, can be fun. Right, you know, it could be at your brown bag, your Zoom brown bag, your virtual brown bag, you um, have a scavenger hunt in the system, right? And see, have people try and find the credentials of a member from Utah who certified in 2017 and see what they bring back. So it can be that sort of um, engaging, gamified training. Right. It can be onboarding. It can be advanced training. Have a user group who also give feedback about when the system is maybe not working as well as it could. And that user group will then give feedback to the technology people who will then give feedback to the, the vendor, the implementation partner for things that need to be changed. It, it, it's, a, it's an ongoing effort. And many of us in IT are not that great at communications. So it's a bit of a stretch, mm. but it's terribly worthwhile. Well, I disagree that you're not that good at communication, but I, we, we actually have 60 seconds left and I wanted to toss off to both of you, what final words of wisdom would you leave us with? And I think we can stretch longer for anyone who's willing to stay on a bit longer. I, you know, for me, it's just, I think buying an AMS is like buying children's shoes. You, you want it to fit now, you want it to fit for some growth in the future, but you don't want to buy something that's so big that it will trip you up. And I think the biggest issue we see is organizations over-purchasing, buying mm -hmm. a system that is too big. They, they can't afford it. They can't capitalize on it. They can't take benefit of all of the things that it offers. So I think to me, that's my absolute word of wisdom. Um, okay. You know, like right. children, children's shoes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
Niraj, what wisdom would you share with us? I think uh, the key point which I liked was this communication stuff where we should keep the communication going at all the phases of the selection and uh, keep all the staff engaged who are actually going to use this system because it is those who are going to use it and like it. So it's better to engage them right from the start rather than engaging them at the end stage, right? Because that is how you're going to get their trust level from them and keep them engaged and keep the communication flowing so that they don't feel disowned or like an orphan in the AMS system. So I think that is, that is what I would, Absolutely. and that is what I liked about uh, that communication stuff, Moira. Thank you so Excellent. much. Excellent. Thank you, Niraj. And I see Michael asked how likely it is to have a successful AMS selection mm. and implementation during COVID times. Let me tell you, there are plenty of organizations embarking on this journey, partly because they've realized in this time of moving to a digital life, they need the products and the tools and the technologies to support their members' expectations. So um, we're working very hard to make them successful. Excellent. Well, thank you, everyone. And um, we will wrap up a reminder that this will be recorded and posted. And for any of the other chat questions we may not have gotten to, we will answer those offline later on. And we invite you to join us next week for the second part in the AMS roadmap, when Gretchen and Kathleen of Delcor will do kickstarting your AMS, the implementation journey, and only they could make it sound fun, you know? That's the 22nd at 1 p.m. Eastern. We will take a break the following week for AMS Fest, which I think will feature some familiar faces from our roadmap. And we return on Wednesday, August 5th to welcome Rebecca A. Church to do her life after launch managing your AMS. So thank you, Moira. Thank you, Niraj. And thank you all of our participants for joining into the conversation. And we will see you a week from today. <laughs>